Okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the structure of our court system and kind of where the laws come from. Now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the trial process itself. So we're going to actually go through the steps of a trial in a minute. Um, but I thought we'd talk real quick about kind of where this right to trial comes from. Um, and if you're not familiar, it does come from our Constitution, so our constitutional law. Um, in particular, it comes from the Sixth Amendment, um, which basically um, provides every citizen a right to a speedy and public trial. Um, so the idea is if you are accused of doing something, uh, we don't just lock you up and throw away the key, right? Um, this country is founded on the idea that everyone deserves to tell their story. Everyone deserves to have an opportunity in court um, and be represented by a legal counsel. So that just uh, gives you a little bit of background about where this right comes from. It's not just something we made up. It's actually in our Constitution. Okay, real quick. Uh, if you're like me, you've probably watched a lot of true crime, a lot of legal shows over your life. Um, so I think we all have maybe a little bit of a skewed view uh, as to what a trial process actually is and the purpose or function of a trial. So I thought we'd look real quick at some of the core functions of the trial process. So really, the function of a trial process here in the U.S. is one, determine the facts of the case. So put everything out there. What are the facts of this case? Let's bring in both sides to tell their story. <clears throat> Second function is to actually decide which rules of law are going to be applied to that particular case. Oh, sorry, a little pop up there. Um, <clears throat> so we actually have to decide which rules of law are gonna be applied. So if it's a federal law or statutory law, we need to know that. Um, and then finally, the main function of a trial is really to interpret and administer whichever laws we believe need to be applied to that case. This is an important one. I think oftentimes we think of trial uh, court actually making law, but they don't make laws, they interpret them. So the laws are created by legislative bodies, they're inherent in our constitution, um, but generally the function of a trial process is to interpret those existing laws. Certainly, um, sometimes case law or precedent is established through a court decision, but generally uh, it's the job of the trial process to interpret and administer existing law. Okay, so I want to talk now a little bit about who the actual parties or players are in the various lawsuits we've been talking about. Uh, because this is important terminology that you're going to hear about all semester. So I want to make sure we all have the same understanding of what we're talking about here. So civil case. We said these are disputes between individuals or disputes between an individual and an organization. Um, so in a civil case, the party that's actually bringing the suit is known as the plaintiff. Um, so you can see here I've given you an example of an actual complaint. This is the U.S. Women's Soccer complaint against the U.S. Soccer Federation. Um, so you can see here, all of those players are listed as plaintiffs. Um, so they're the party bringing the suit. And then the defendant is the party being tried. So you can see here listed as defendant is the U.S. Soccer Federation. Um, so again, civil case, plaintiff is the party bringing the suit, defendant is the party being tried. Okay, criminal case, it's a little bit different. Um, you'll notice some crossover here with the defendant, but there's a different terminology for the party bringing the case. So in a criminal case, it's not a plaintiff that's bringing the case. It's what we call a prosecutor. Um, so here it's the legal party uh, responsible for presenting the case against an individual accused of breaking the law. So in a criminal case, you won't see a name listed as the plaintiff. Typically what you'll see is whatever state that party resides in. So in the Jerry Sandusky trial from uh, several years back, uh, he was the Penn State coach accused of uh, molesting some of the young boys within their program. In that particular case, he was being accused of a crime. So instead of those individual plaintiffs filing a lawsuit against him, although some of them did in the civil um, ground, um, the state of Pennsylvania uh, brought a case on behalf of those individuals. So that's what we're referring to when we refer to the prosecutor in a criminal case. So if you were to read the complaint in this particular trial, it likely said state of Pennsylvania versus uh, Jerry Sandusky. 
Um, so in this case, you see defendant is the same in both civil and criminal cases. So the party being tried is still going to be the defendant. It's just going to be that party that's bringing the case that's different. Okay, um, let's see here. I want to talk about the various steps in the trial process. Um, now, your book goes into a little bit more detail on this topic, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I do want to highlight a few things here. Okay, first step in the trial process is what we call pleading. This is kind of the step of a trial process that all the paperwork is filed. Uh, it's kind of a boring step, but in order for a case to move forward, a lot of paperwork is required. Um, so here in the pleading, you have a couple of different sub steps. Um, that first is a complaint. So in order for a trial to start, you actually have to have someone file initial paperwork claiming what their complaint is, right? So basically just a form explaining why they're suing someone else. Uh, from there, a summons is delivered to the defendant. So basically, they're given legal documentation explaining why they're being sued and by who. Um, from there, the defendant does have an opportunity to respond through what we call the answer phase. So here they get a chance to either you know, plead guilty or maybe say they want to fight the claim or in some cases actually file a counterclaim against the person bringing the suit. So a couple different options there. Um, but in general, that's step one, pleading. It's where we're getting all the paperwork knocked out. Okay, next step, step two, which is called the discovery phase. This is basically where both sides are doing all their homework, right? They're collecting all the information they might need to bring this case to court. Um, so that could depend, you know, varies depending on the case, right? Um, so someone might be gathering um, video footage of an incident in order to um, show that in the actual trial. Um, someone might be um, uh, trying to gather medical evidence, right, uh, medical records. These are some examples of the information that might be gathered um, during that discovery process. Um, I'm going to let you guys do a little bit more digging on these definitions in your book, uh, deposition versus interrogatory. Um, but basically what you need to know is the deposition <coughs> is going to occur in the courtroom. So uh, a witness actually comes there and is recorded um, their question. An interrogatory is a little bit less invasive, um, might involve them filling out some kind of form or questionnaire outside of court. But uh, again, your textbook goes into a little bit more detail there. Step three, uh, we have what are called pretrial motions. Keep in mind, we're three steps into the trial process here and we haven't even started a trial, right? So a lot of steps coming before an actual trial. Um, basically here, both sides, and what I should say is both lawyers for each side, <clears throat> have the opportunity to basically get the case to stop where it's at. So um, they might file a motion to dismiss saying, hey, we want this case thrown out. We don't think that the plaintiff has enough evidence to move forward. Um, they might also want to file what we call motion for summary judgment. That just means, hey, we think you, as the judge, you have enough information now, you can determine this case today. We don't need to go to trial. Um, so there are a number of pretrial motions beyond these two. These are just a couple of examples. Um, but basically, this is the phase where the lawyers work with the judge and uh, attempt to stop the trial where it's at and keep it from actually going um, to trial. Okay, step four is jury selection. Um, this is a process where essentially both sides um, get the opportunity to select the members of a jury. Um, you can see a definition there for a jury if you're not familiar. Um, typically what happens in these jury selection process is an interview process. So if you've been called for jury duty, you're probably familiar with this already. Uh, if you haven't been, um, this interview process uh, is known as what we call vior dire. Another Latin term basically just means interview process. So uh, potential jurors will be questioned. They might fill out a questionnaire. If they make it past that phase, they might actually be questioned by the lawyers on both sides. It's a long drawn out process, which ultimately ends with either side getting to say yes or no to a potential juror. Um, 
with the goal, obviously, to make it a fair trial so that you have um, people that are going to make a decision not based on any kind of um, background, uh, familiarity, or history that might impact their decision-making process. Um, important to note here that with civil cases, the plaintiff has the option. They can either have a jury trial, which is the traditional form, or they can have a non-jury trial which is referred to as a bench trial. So basically they can decide, hey, I don't want a jury in here. I just want the judge making the ultimate decision. Obviously it's gonna depend on the individual plaintiff and what their case is, but that is an option. Okay, so we finally made it to the trial, step five. Um, so again, anytime we see a trial on TV or in the movies, generally we're starting here, but really, um, in reality, there are a lot of steps that come before actually getting to the trial. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, a lot of cases don't even get to this stage, um, and as you read in your reading. Um, so the trial itself, um, listed here sort of the steps of the trial. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. Uh, I do just want to mention that <clears throat> there are a couple of key terms here that we should um, be familiar with, um, and I've highlighted those. So testimony and exhibits. So these are um, things that can happen during the presentation of evidence. Um, so testimony is generally when you actually call up a witness and ask for their testimony, ask for them to tell their story, uh, provide information to the court. Exhibits are actual evidence. So if a lawyer brings an actual uh, piece of evidence they want to show, whether that's video footage, medical record, whatever it might be, um, they would actually bring that in as an exhibit. So that's just the difference between those two there. Um, in testimony, you can call either an expert witness or a fact witness. So this one's important for us to be familiar with. So an expert witness is generally someone who has a particular expertise on a topic. Um, so let's say that we've got a trial involving a school uh, and an incident that occurred in a PE class. Uh, an expert witness in this case might be someone who has you know, a long career as a physical education teacher. Right? They could be considered an expert witness. They likely have nothing to do with the school, with this community, but they've got experience in the field that could be helpful for that courtroom to hear, for that jury to hear. On the other side of that, you can call a fact witness. Um, so a fact witness is someone who was actually there, who has first-hand information or an account of something that happened surrounding um, the trial or the incident. Um, so a fact witness doesn't necessarily have to have an expertise, but they have to have an awareness of what occurred because they saw it firsthand. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the difference between an expert witness and a fact witness. Um, finally, there you see just sort of a breakdown of the trial itself. Again, I'm not going to go into too much um, detail about that. So I think you probably have seen that play out in some kind of media at some point in your life. Okay, before we talk about judgment here, I do want to mention that <clears throat> per your reading, uh, I think the estimate is that 90 cases don't actually make it to that trial process. Um, so you can imagine, um, we're going to talk here in a minute about the settlement um, element uh, of the trial process. Uh, but that's pretty crazy to think about. You know, we often think of any case that's filed as going to trial, but the reality is most cases don't get to that courtroom, don't get to that trial process. Uh, and there are various reasons for why, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here on the next few slides. Um, step six is the judgment. Um, so this is essentially where the jury is provided instructions. Um, so they might be given instructions about how they are to decide that case, which laws are to base it on. Um, that jury will then deliberate for some time. Um, could be a matter of minutes, hours, days, really depends on the trial and the jury makeup. Um, and then finally, a verdict is delivered. Okay. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the appeals process because um, I think generally there's some confusion here with students. Um, so important to note that an appeal is not a retrial, so not necessarily a retrial. Um, we think of appeals, we think someone's not happy with the decision of their trial, so they want to do over. And that's just not what the appeals process is built for. You can see the main function here of an appellate court is to review what has already happened at that initial court level 
and basically decide whether any legal errors have occurred. So if a legal error has occurred in that initial trial, then uh, various decisions could be made. Uh, and you can see there are basically three different options here. Um, a decision can be affirmed, which means that the judge agrees with that decision of the lower court and basically nothing changes, right? They affirm what was decided, moving on. Uh, another option, if the judge decides that they disagree with that decision and that there's clear evidence that legal statute wasn't followed, then they have the ability to reverse that decision. Keep in mind, it is very rare for a court to reverse a case or a trial decision. Uh, I think it's less than 10% of appeal cases are actually reversed by a judge. So this is pretty rare occurrence. Uh, the last option here is that uh, a court can uh, remand a case. Um, and when we say remand, basically what that means is <clears throat> they're sending the case back down to the lower court level for a retrial. Um, so a retrial can occur, but <clears throat> the judge at the appeals level has to make that decision. They have to find that some kind of legal error occurred, either in the jury process or the way the law was applied. There are a number of things that could impact that, that could create a legal error, but they have to be able to find one in order to actually send that case back down um, to the trial court level. Okay, we mentioned earlier that <clears throat> very few cases actually make it to the trial process. So what often happens instead is what we call a settlement. So basically the parties come together before an actual trial and resolve uh, the disagreement. Now in a civil case, that typically means some kind of monetary damages are exchanged. Um, in a civil trial, what the plaintiff is seeking is really just to be put back into the financial position that they were in prior to the dispute, okay? So in a civil settlement, basically they're looking for some kind of monetary damages. Keep in mind, civil lawsuit system is not meant to be like a get-rich scheme, right? Uh, civil courts are looking to put that person back into the financial position they were prior to any kind of dispute. Um, criminal uh, cases, on the other hand, are a little bit different in the settlement process. So a settlement in a criminal case might mean that the <clears throat> um, defendant agrees to serve X number of years in jail. Um, or they might, if it's less severe, they might agree to some kind of community service hours. Um, so instead of monetary damages here in a criminal case, typically they're agreeing to serve some kind of time. A um, couple of examples here of prominent settlements. Uh, you might remember a couple of years ago, um, Jameis Winston uh, was accused of rape while he was at Florida State. Um, that plaintiff ended up suing uh, the university because they failed to properly manage that complaint that she had made from a Title IX office perspective. Um, and they ultimately ended up having to pay her, I believe it was like $800,000 in the settlement. Again, that was decided before actually going to court. Um, similarly, more recently, you probably have followed um, this Michigan State case with the gymnastics trainer, uh, Larry Nasir, who was accused of um, assaulting many women uh, at the university. Um, and they have recently paid out a $500 million um, settlement to those plaintiffs. So you can see that oftentimes in these cases, settlements end up being paid out by the organization itself. In these cases, sport organization, um, you know, athletic department through these universities. Um, but important to keep in mind that this is honestly the way most of the cases that you see will end up, some kind of settlement. Um, and again, the reasons vary, um, but oftentimes people are looking to avoid a trial. Um, they're looking to avoid a trial because it's costly, right? You got to pay a lawyer, you got to pay court fees, it could be expensive. Um, you're trying to avoid time. So if you're involved in a court case, it could take years of your life. Um, and so people want to avoid that, right? They want to just get on with their lives. So they might um, want to settle because of that. Um, for a lot of sport and recreation organizations, again, they're trying to avoid bad PR. So instead of having the case play out for years in the media, it may be better to make that settlement and get it to go away. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground in this first week's module. Uh, we introduced the concept of the American legal system. 
Um, we talked about the structure of our court system here in the U.S. as well as the United States Supreme Court and how that works. And then in the second series, we also looked at the trial process and the various steps involved. So again, uh, I understand that some of this and probably a lot of it is review for many of you, but hopefully now that you've had a chance to review the textbook reading and these video lectures, um, we're all kind of on the same page now when it comes to some of these key legal concepts. Uh, and you're going to get a chance to apply these various concepts through your case study this week. So make sure that you are reviewing all of the materials on the ReggieNet module and completing that case study in preparation for class. All right, thanks.